discussion with you all. Thank you once again for joining us in person and online, I mean virtually as well. We had given, us, we had given ourselves two minutes before we start and they're over. We'd like for everyone to settle so that we can begin our session for today. And our session for today, as you can see on the screen, and for those who are joining us in person, is the Afrofeminist Artificial Intelligence AI Governance Challenges and Lessons at the IGF of 2022. We have a Zoom link. If you want, you can share with your colleagues back in your countries. Um, it's available on the website as well. You can also um, be able to check out who is on the panel today on the official IGF website. And the panel session is uh, WS-439, so that you can get additional um, information about everyone on the panel today. We want to request that you bear with us. We are seated on this very big panel. <laughs> It's not, um, it's not like us, but it's so that we can be able to, uh, I think, offer translation and also because the, the microphones down here are not working very well. So we are together in spirit, although quite far from you. Feel our warmth. Um, and then for those online, uh, we hope you have your cups of tea ready. We hope you have your coffee and let's have fun. If you need to share anything, yes, you see Yolanda, if you need um, to share anything, uh, please share in the chat. If you feel there's something maybe we are not clear enough, please let us do let us know in the chat and someone will be following up and coordinating. Bridget and Yolanda, feel free to also share with us if you feel we need to repeat the question or repeat something so that we can work together. And to officially start us off, I'd like to start us off by asking everyone in this room and everyone on the Zoom link right now, um, before I introduce myself, I have an opening question for us all. How many sessions have you attended at the IGF so far or this year on AI that you have seen a woman or an African woman on the panel by a show of hands? One, two, one, two, three, four, five. On the Zoom link as well, I'm so happy to, uh, to see that many of you attend uh, different panel discussions and 
a woman or an African woman is represented. But to set, a, to set the ball rolling, I'd like to start us off with introduction. We'll start with our speakers on the Zoom link, Yolanda and, uh, yes, we'll start with the online team, that's Bridget and Yolanda, and then we'll proceed to the in-person team who are with me here today. So, Bridget, please take a few minutes to introduce yourself and your organization, and then followed with Yolanda. Karibu. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, I, I see Bobina nodding, so I'm assuming everyone can hear me in the room as well. It is such a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my name is Bridget Boachi once again, and I am the Artificial Intelligence Lead at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Um, I have a data science background, and I am passionate about using technology to deliver for uh, citizens. So it is my pleasure to have this conversation, and I look forward to sharing a bit more about what we do at the Tony Blair Institute, um, as well as specifically our initiative on African women in AI, as well as um, AI adoption on the continent in a bit. Uh, thank you once again. Over to you, Yolanda. Thank you, Bridget, and um, thank you to Policy for inviting me, and hello to everyone. It's great to be here virtually. I'm in Brussels right now because we have a conference at the European Parliament tomorrow on AI policy. I'm Yolanda Lanquist. I'm Director of AI Governance at the Future Society. The Future Society is a nonprofit based in the U.S., incubated at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, focused on AI policy with a mission to align AI through better governance. Um, I'm um, on this panel because we led the development of three national AI strategies in Africa, one by competitive tender for with GIZ, the Fair Forward Project of GIZ. GIZ is Germany's foreign development agency. And with the government ministries uh, of the countries, which were Rwanda, Ghana, and Tunisia, and with Smart Africa. So I'll be trying to share the recommendations that we developed for those national AI strategies uh, towards inclusive uh, AI policy. So looking forward and thank you so much. And now, and now over to our physical team here present at the IGF in Addis Ababa. We'll begin with Amber, then proceed to Quito, myself, and then Bobina will get into it. Welcome, Amber. Thanks so much, Irene. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Sinha. Uh, I'm here from India. I work at the intersection of law, technology, and society, and uh, a lot of my research focuses on digital rights and the regulatory systems around them. Uh, I'm currently the director of research at Policy Data Institute, and I also serve as a senior fellow working on trustworthy AI with Mozilla Foundation. Uh, prior to this, I worked at the Center for Internet and Society in India, where uh, until earlier this year, I was their executive director. So I am really looking forward to this session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kito Shilongo. Um, I'm part of Research ICT Africa. We are a think tank based in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'm from Namibia, and I work on several projects at Research ICT Africa focused on um, AI, specifically just AI and data justice. Um, I'm very interested in uh, adapting feminist frameworks into um, how we conceptualize um, AI policies um, and um, frameworks. And I'm very excited to have this conversation and very excited to also learn Learn from the audience. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I am the moderator for today. My name is Irene Mwendwa. I am a Kenyan and I work for Policy, which is a Ugandan based feminist civic tech, and I lead the strategic initiatives there. And looking forward to just learning from this panel as well learning as well as learning from everyone. Over to you, Bobina. 
Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobina Zulfa, and I'm a data and digital rights researcher with policy. Like my colleague said, policy is a civic tech uh, based in Kampala, but work across the region, work at the intersection of data, tech, and society. Um, myself, I've been um, working on uh, this uh, Afro-feminist framework for AI um, governance. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this session because it's a, a part of, I'd say, a consultancy to just get more viewpoints to add to you know uh, the work we're doing and yeah excited for this discussion with everyone time has passed but um, we'd like to give Bobina just a few minutes to speak about the Afrofeminist AI policy framework work that we've gotten into as policy and also that encompasses everyone's uh, contributions before we dive straight into the questions Right, thank you. Um, well, uh, just very quickly, I will. Um, so, this Afro feminist um, AI governance framework, uh, one would ask themselves, I think, a couple of questions. What do you mean, Afro feminist? And then, um, because we know there is a number of, um, you know, AI frameworks and principles that are being developed globally. Um, however, um, with the work that we've been doing at Policy, just um, looking at gender and um, AI on the continent, uh, there's a number of, you know, would say gaps in terms of just structural inequalities um, pertaining to, you know, AI and, you know, African women that we felt the need to address through a framework that directly addresses a number of these gaps and issues. And so this was conceptualized of that basis and we're doing this together with IDRC and a number of other partners. And um, yeah, uh, so basically the, the framework proposes, you know, puts across a number of the problems that we think pertain particularly to, um, you know, um, directly affect African women in terms of, you know, AI development and deployment across the continent, and then just propose a number of solutions. And so uh, it's interesting that we've just, we get to get out in spaces like this and get in more viewpoints to our work, contribute to our literature and, you know, just knowledge production as a whole. And yeah, I, I, I look forward to just having more discussions with everyone here, even just outside this um, conversation itself. But that's a little bit about that. And it's really just to contribute to yesterday, one of the um, stakeholders during the opening ceremony talked about, you know, a UN family. And, you know, we believe to have the, you know, what would call global, um, you know, um, to have a global framework, it should be representative of different perspectives from, you know, different people and different, um, you know, demographics. And we believe, you know, uh, the, do, uh, the particular group African women's um, voice in the AI discourse has not been represented. And so we think this is something that would be helping directly address that gap. And so, yeah, that's pretty much about this and yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for the introductions. And participants, feel free to follow policy. You'll be able to get contacts of the team members you can see on stage and on the screen. And to get right into the panel of today, we are going to be discussing on issues of marginality, power, and not necessarily bias. And we'll also look at Afrofeminist AI governance. That's African. Um, African women being engaged in AI governance, and also the vision of an emancipatory AI for all. And to get right into it, I'm going to address a few questions to, I'll start us off with Kito and Bobina, whichever order. I would like to ask you specifically, Kito, in light of a number of principles and frameworks towards ethical and responsible AI, why is there a need for multiple perspectives in addressing challenges of AI systems from across from across the globe. And then for you, Bobina, on intersectionality and marginality, what do you think is the role of African women um, in all their diversities? Thank you and welcome. Um, thank you, Irene, for that question. Um, I think this is a very important question and um, I just want to start off this conversation or by saying that um, I think it's sometimes very unfortunate that often as African women and women of color and people who are marginalized and vulnerable in our, in our societies have to come to these stages and these platforms and talk about being included. And um, yeah, with ha having said that, I think um, different uh, multiple perspectives are important uh, because the principles and the frameworks that we have or we 
we are drafting and developing um, determine how the various uh, policy actions and policy areas uh, are operationalized, uh, op operationalized and how and which um, policy issues are prioritized. Um, the first and foremost, I think um, most, if you look at the OECD principles, for instance, and many other frameworks, even the African Union data policy framework, um, one principle that is, 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 is present in all of them is creating or developing human-centered um, technologies that are based on human-centered uh, values and fairness. And um, from an African pers perspective, um, I think we have, uh, as we are a large co uh, continent, first of all, but we also have very um, diverging or various um, values. And as um, from a feminist perspective, um, what, um, you know, the, the social values that that could be that people have, for instance, in, 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 in Europe, um, where it's more very small knit families, for instance, in communities, and we are more like, you know, um, um, larger groups, it, we are, uh, it's, it's differing. And, um, and so when we ask ourselves, what, what, is, what, what is the greater interest? When we develop AI, what is, are the interests of the people and who are the people? And so when the, we bring the different people to the stage, we um, hear their perspectives, hear their values, hear um, what risks they are faced um, from these technologies. Um, and in developing principles, we are also able to uh, come up with the appropriate safeguards um, against the risks that, are, that these uh, technologies um, pose to um, communities. Um, and I think protection of, of women, for instance, and um, as well as children and um, as well as um, our, con our concepts of um, what these harms are. I think, um, okay, what I'm trying to say is that um, designing technology with the appropriate safeguards um, requires different perspectives. And these per perspectives come about when we talk to various people. And I think in Africa, for instance, uh, what do we do when we ask ourselves, what do we do when we come into communities where, or in countries where our rights are not recognized as women, um, as, as queer people or um, LGBTQ people, um, where the different institutions uh, which safeguard the rights of people living with uh, disabilities, for instance, how do we in incorporate those um, frameworks and those principles into the design design of techno, um, AI technologies. And if we conceptualize those kinds of safeguards that we need, then we're able to come up with the capacity for human intervention and oversight. And so if we say um, we need to protect women against gender-based violence, we've seen um, in Southern Africa, for instance, we've seen AI for good technologies which are looking at gender-based violence. Um, the way that we think about um, privacy and the way that we think about families is very different in Southern Africa. Um, people, a lot of women who are victims of uh, gender-based violence live with their perpetrators. They share phones. Women do not have um, phones, for instance, by themselves. They share phones with um, the people who abuse them. And if you're using an AI chatbot to, you know, um, 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 respond or pro provide them with, with um, assistance, how does that you know, uh, affect that social issue? So I think in other countries, for instance, or in other countries where people, more people have access to phones and don't share phones, those might work, but that those kind of um, technologies pose, put women at, more, at further risk. And so when we come up and say, yes, um, it's good that we can have technology, it's good that we can have a chatbot that can you know, talk to women, um, it's very different on the ground. Mm. And um, another thing is the principles of um, freedoms and, and, and how we perceive um, equality and social justice. Um, I, a very important part of um, AI, AI principles is how we look at um, the good that comes from the, the technologies that we are you know, developing. And a lot of times we have to go back and think about the social justice um, aspects and, and the, the um, structural inequalities, mm -hmm. historical inequalities that we are faced as, as Africans, as women, as, 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 as young people as well, and incorporate that in how we design our policies or how we design our strategies, AI strategies. Um, secondly, 
um, the risks that are posed by AI technologies disproportionately affect certain groups, women, dis uh, people living with um, disabilities. And so when we, you know, how do we define, how do we conceptualize and define harm? And the only way that we can do that, there's no one way, like what is harmful to someone else in, in, in the East of Africa is different what is harmful to someone else in, in the West and in the, in the South of the continent. And so we need to have these multiple perspectives that really encompass and bring together how we define harm and, and not posing how, yeah, and how we think about do no harm technologies and proportionality as well. Um, I've, we've seen the kind of research that we've done, we've seen that um, organizations have in, in Southern Africa um, specifically are, have projects that they are looking at the conservation of, 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 of um, um, the environment and the overall projects have good objectives. Um, but you know, when, when you introduce technology and when you introduce AI, so if you're looking at conservation of environment, it's very non-personal and it's not related to any person. But then when you look at those, you know, those technologies even deeper and the issues around that, they pose a lot of risks to the people who live in these communities. So they have, um, we've seen, for instance, um, technologies that are tracking wildlife um, um, in Southern Africa. And those, it's just looking at footprints. Of, 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 of wildlife. But in looking at how the wildlife tracks, you also are able to, um, in a way, in a very insidious way, tr um, surveil um, um, nomad communities like the sand community. So they move around with how you know, the animals move. And so we think about that. You, you wouldn't think about that, okay, um, what kind of risk would some a technology that is uh, tracking wildlife pose on the people around that. And it also determines how we think about how technology can impact um, conservation, environmental sustainability. Um, finally, I want to talk about the issue of sustainability um, in bringing uh, all of our perspectives in, 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 uh, into these principles and how we, we view them. Um, I think we um, contribute not only to the human, like, you know, the economic uh, sustainability of AI, impacts of AI, but also the cultural and the social. And um, I, we've always talked about Ubuntu. Mm. And when we talk about Ubuntu, we forget about the fact that they are women. And we forget about these principle, these feminist principles that can be included in Ubuntu. So from the West, yes, we want a philosophy or we want um, policies and, and frameworks that are based on um, Ubuntu and communal and relational um, values. But those are not separated from feminist values. And somehow women are always lost in those uh, conversations where we talk about Ubuntu and Ubuntu principles, for instance. I want to speak about an example of in, in Namibia. And we have, um, I think a lot of times when, you know, in, it, when we talk about in, uh, perspectives, we, we're also talking about participation. And so um, in the conservation um, um, sector, when they came up with these participation um, frameworks, um, they used very, they used, um, a, you know, they tied it to, to Ubuntu. And so they were like, okay, we're gonna come into this, um, into this constituency and um, they are gonna um, control the, the, or yeah, govern the way that the resources, the shared resources are used within that constituency. And it is, okay, we're using Ubuntu. And then later on they realized that the challenges that they have are, um, only the men are benefiting in those communities from the use of those resources. And so we need to think about like, you know, when we adapt Ubuntu uh, principles, like how, which, how does the value, um, um, how is the value distributed and how do we think about the harms that come from that? Um, sorry, Irene is nudging me on time. Okay. Um, very happy to discuss further. Oh, okay. Um, Right. Uh, I, well, I think you've just gone over a number of things that I just uh, wanted to speak on as well. But I, um, you know, I think just really building from, um, you know, a number of things you've been going over in terms of just um, intersectionality, I think it's just important to highlight that, um, um, you know, the need for, uh, I feel, frameworks like the this particular Afrofeminist uh, governance framework is, uh, you know, recognizing that. Um, particularly groups like say African women are um, 
there is a, a whole number of areas, um, you know, via which they are, you know, um, structurally oppressed. And so you find that uh, we look at, you know, as an African woman, you know, if, you know, in your day to day interactions with, you know, a number of, um, you know, platforms where, you know, obviously the, your, there is uh, AI systems involved. Um, as, as a black woman, there is a number of, you know, structural oppressions that, you know, you're going to meet um, being a woman as well, um, being, um, you know, in terms of also your social, um, you know, economic conditions, you find there is also a number of limitations in terms of access and um, usage and even issues like, you know, language, because we see, for example, language is a big issue in terms of, you know, a lot of AI systems because um, barely any African languages are, you know, um, uh, a part of a lot of the you know NLP models that are being developed, and so of course that means there is marginalisation in terms of you know usage and access. So uh, I think um, it's very important to just you know very be to point out the need to look at the intersectional needs of. Uh, a number of people, including uh, African women in developing AI systems and just their deployment across the continent beyond just um, developing systems that are, you know, that target, um, you know, a universal user because there is no such thing as a universal user. There is a number of people with different needs and so there is a need to pay attention to these needs. And so I think also this just speaks to the, you know, the rate at which a lot of AI systems are being developed is obviously uh, very exponential. And so there is barely any, you know, let's take care and, you know, um, pay attention to the needs of different people, but it's just like, let's develop and go quicker and et cetera. And so I think there is just a need to pause and like factor in the needs of all these different people, particularly African women here that we are proposing. And yeah, I think that'll be my contribution to that. Thank you. Bobina and Kito, and I hope everyone is following. Those of you who are just joining us, thank you very much for joining us. This is the panel on Afrofeminist AI governance. And I'll go straight into our online team and those of us who are joining us virtually, uh, Yolanda. Uh, we are going to be speaking about power and not necessarily bias to show you how power, um, th the person who has power really is in charge of um, putting out the best systems, the best policies and so forth. But over to you, Yolanda, and I hope you can hear me. Should AI or artificial intelligence challenges be approached as power issues and not just bias or so? Uh, for example, issues on practicality of artificial intelligence principles and frameworks, uh, al al algorithmic um, aided disinformation or hate speech. Um, over to you, Yolanda, and you have seven minutes. Sure, thanks so much, everyone, um, and for the previous remarks. And I'll save it for others, since I think there could be other perspectives for the panel on this. Um, in terms of power dynamics that I'll bring expertise on um, before hearing from others. A crucial crucial point I want to make that is core to the three national AI strategies that we worked on. Again, those are uh, Rwanda, Ghana, and Tunisia, and which I know Smart Africa is taking seriously as well, is digital inclusion. So this is digital infrastructure like internet, rollout, penetration, reliability, affordability, affordability and access to smartphones. Um, because once there is are more people online, women, rural areas, um, lower income areas, then you get more diversity and inclusion, not just in who has access to AI, but crucially whose data is being contributed by a digital systems to AI and uh, that could limit bias. Um, but it's uh, very important because this data collection challenges in a lot of the African countries, there's data shortages in all, in all <laughs> it's data collection is such a major challenge even in the US, but particularly in regions where there's less digitized data, there's more paper records like in public sectors um, and where there's fewer people online, including in demographic lines. So we have um, uh, smart young people, graduates from computer science programs, and um, develop using pre-trained models from the West, models trained on Western data, not as um, 
um, I think as Bobina mentioned, for example, in languages, not enough local language data, uh, not enough local image data. Um, so that's why digital infrastructure, digital inclusion is so important. And we can add to that uh, AI literacy and digital literacy campaigns. So a couple of the countries have targeted programs specifically for women in AI and, and coding for AI. And this goes also to education reform and curricula reform to make sure that the number of um, women and, and also other demographics, including rural areas, are really included. So also when we recommend AI hubs or AI meetups, it shouldn't just be in the capital city. It should also be in other parts of the country, for example, and there should be ones targeting women. And so these are some, and, and, and along the lines of data as well, we'll also have as a core pillar in the national AI strategies, data sharing and data governance guidelines. So besides data governance, like for security and privacy, uh, data protection commission or um, uh, a key actor in the in the AI community can, can provide guidance on how to collect and share data responsibly. And this can facilitate data sharing so that we have more data and more representative data. But I'll go ahead and, and hand this over to others who want to speak more specifically on power dynamics, if there are any other views or questions on this. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, because of time, I'll move on to the next set of questions and then I'll, I'll be able to ask for the team who are checking online for any comments and questions, and then we'll take a few comments and questions in the room. But allow us to proceed. And Amber, this is for you. Um, are data justice ideals such as data ownership and meaningful consent data regimes in the current capitalistic data ext extravist um, global structures just that? Are they just ideals or is there a way to realize their practicability? So, I, thanks, thanks, Arjun. I think to begin with, uh, we need to recognize the entrenched structural inequities that exist within the data economy. And uh, I think when we talk about the, the primacy of data in, in, in uh, governance debates in the recent past, perhaps there is no better indicator than the very, very hackneyed and overworked metaphors to describe it. So in the last few years, apart from you know data being likened to oil, it has been uh, compared to mineral deposits. It has been compared to dividend deposits. It's been also compared to the Alaskan Permanent Fund. And on the other end of the spectrum, people have looked at the harmful impact of data processing. And people like Martin Tisney, for instance, have compared it to carbon dioxide. And others have compared uh, its impact for harm to uh, uranium and other pollutants. So when we have to think about confronting this structural inequity, then we must also try to figure out what the appropriate metaphor for data would be. So data ownership, for instance, is something that you mentioned, Irene, and, and that has a lot of intuitive power as a metaphor. Uh, but when we start likening data to property, or as a lot of policy documents across countries have fashioned data as an asset to be leveraged, the the thing that we have to be careful about is that within the existing data economy, uh, how it positions a uh, different set of actors. So the, in, in the way data exists right now, or, or the way data flows exist right now, uh, the, the ownership rights to data are largely through non-negotiable one-sided contracts are largely uh, controlled by data processors and data controllers. Even if we were to reverse that trend, uh, what we have to be careful about is, uh, is to ensure that data ownership, even on part of data subjects, doesn't lead to outcomes which are exploitative. Because in, in, in the current uh, market economy, uh, what that might end up meaning is that uh, data will just position itself more and more as a tradable asset and uh, and people who are more disadvantaged will actually get a worse deal for their data. The other way to look at data perhaps could be data as labor where uh, you know data is you know a very clear manifestation of the of the labor put in by those 
who are involved in the generation of data, people who are participants in uh, processes which lead to the generation of that data. And uh, But there also, I think, uh, when we start fashioning data as labor, we have to be careful uh, in terms of, of what kind of, of labor values attached to different uh, demographics. So somebody who consumes uh, data, uh, you know, uh, some more, let's say, luxurious products and uh, is part of a, of a better off demographic, there will be more advertising interest in their data. So, so how we assign value to the uh, to the labor in that data is important. So, according to me, I think perhaps the best way to fashion data is to think of a metaphor around autonomy. So, uh, I think going back to what uh, we, you know, you're talking about Ubuntu earlier and the rights of collectives. And autonomy also can exist at various levels. It can exist at individual as well as collective levels. And I think. Uh, sort of looking at data as something that arises from people's bodies and uh, and the ways in which it compromises individual choice and autonomy. I think uh, centering that part of the conversation is important and that's not something that in a lot of debates around data is happening. So, and there are various pieces, since you spoke about practicality, I mean, there are various pieces to that conversation. At the first level, we need to conceptually agree that uh, something like decisional autonomy can be an appropriate metaphor for data. And then we need to look at ways in which that can be realized. So collectives which represent uh, identity-based interests uh, could be one way to do that. And, and, and that could, in a very direct way, confront uh, the power dynamics at play because individuals are often not in a position to exercise that sort of power. Uh, then looking at, uh, you know, how collective uh, choice versus individual choice needs to be balanced out and perhaps in cases of conflict, we have to be very clear that we privilege individual choice mm -hmm. and individual autonomy over an overbearing collective interest. So those are pieces of conversation that need to happen and, and what we need is, is is more workable models, a few collective experiments that try to realize that vision of data. I'll pause there. Wow, thank you very much, Yolanda and Amber. Uh, just before I proceed to Bridget, I just want, I just picked something very strong from the last two speakers. And one is the metaphors, the metaphors that we use. We tweet, we write articles, we write academic papers. We start off, data is the new mineral. Data is the new oil. We need to be quite careful because if we position this this way, then we continue to disadvantage those who are never able to afford those minerals in the first place. Um, and just, um, you know, just to jump to Bridget, um, I just I'll go straight to Bridget because we have other questions and just ask you direct. Bridget, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I okay, can. okay. Thank you. So I'll just jump straight to you and ask: How can governments be empowered in terms of artificial intelligence oversight responsibility? Thank you for that question, Irene. And, uh, it's one that's really at our core at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, um, where we do two main things, which is public policy and government advisory. And literally every day our question is, how do we help governments to deliver for their citizens? Um, the other reason why I also really like this question is because it allows us to humanize governments and policymakers a bit by thinking about what we can do to support them in their work. I think sometimes, especially in technology, we tend to um, sort of give this, overarching power to governments uh, where we can do a lot to support them in, in thinking about how they deliver the AI future that we all want. Uh, so in terms of this question and you know, how we empower governments to actually deliver on this and to use AI responsibly, including oversight, we think about it in two ways. And we recently uh, published a report where I would invite everyone to, to read if you're interested in uh, learning more about this. But I think the, the first way is to support governments and really understanding the opportunity available to them through AI and then to help them to test and adopt 
the technology responsibly. We say this because of two primary reasons. One, it is it is really difficult to regulate or have oversight over something that you don't understand. Um, so we think there's a tremendous opportunity to educate policymakers and governments on AI. And um, you know, an example I like to give this from this year is we've seen some of the the oversight hearings around technology harms, etc. And um, it's really clear that some of our policymakers in, in Africa and around the world don't really understand what AI is. And it would be easy to ridicule this fact, um, but I think instead we have, you know, for such a, a broad and fast moving technology uh, such as AI, we have an opportunity to bring folks from policy, the future society, industry together to provide trainings and workshops that really helps policymakers to to understand um, what the technology is, its harms and, and um, its benefits as well. I think the other reason why it's important to, to educate policymakers in this regard as a, as a step towards empowering them um, is that it, there's a true value in having policymakers understand how they can use the technology um, responsibly to deliver effective digital applications and citizens uh, systems for their citizens. I think Yolanda, Keto, Amber, everyone has talked about some of the concerns that we have here. Um, but there's, the, you know, through the concerns, there's a clear opportunity that uh, that presents itself and policymakers can take advantage of if they understand, um, you know, if they understand what the technology is able to do, especially within the, its current context and constraints as opposed to sort of within the hype of, of what AI is. The second reason that we, we really believe in empowering policymakers and taking sort of this facade away from who they are and what they do is, uh, um, I think that there's an opportunity to provide frameworks, which is, which is what we really appreciate about the work policy does. We don't only talk about educating policymakers, but we provide tools for them to be able to do their work well. Um, so in our recent report, we cite that responsible AI is really key for policymakers to enable the transformation we want to see in the public sector. Um, it's also key for foreign direct investment, as well as in assisting talent attraction and retention. Uh, and this, the idea that responsible AI has clear dividends needs to continue to be shared and developed. And the tools that we provide from Afrofeminist AI frameworks um, to some of the tools we have in our toolkit continue to empower governments to think about uh, AI more holistically, to think about some of the issues of digital inclusion, um, ethics uh, and, and um, procurement, et cetera, that I think we've discussed on the panel. Um, so again, thank you for the question, Irene. I think to sum it up, uh, we need to take away the, the mysticism around who politicians are, who governments are, we need to understand that they can be supported, they can be empowered through the work that we do, uh, all of us do on, 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 you know, in our respective spaces, um, and that education is really at the key of advancing the issue of oversight and responsible governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bridget and I are literally almost the same person, quite passionate about politi political and government engagement. And I'd like to request all of you, you have to find ways to continue engaging your local government elected officials beyond your national level elected officials in the AI and technology discourse. But um, I had to interchange questions because I thought the next question will need more time. And it's based on the first question that we asked in this room on how many of you have attended sessions this year on AI, on artificial intelligence, and you've had a woman on the panel speaking or uh, an African woman being an expert on AI speaking. And we asked that right when we began. And those who joined us, I hope you're able to um, interact with that question and think about it for your 2022 and for your future work to continue to invite African women to speak on your AI uh, panels and engage in your artificial intelligence work. But Bobina and then Kito, techno-chauvinism is becoming more evident in a number of AI for development programs. We know why this happens in the global south under the pretext of progress. How can we foster safer artificial intelligence or AI development and deployment that does not violate fundamental human 
uh, fundamental human rights and dignity. Welcome, Bobina. Thank you, Irene. Um, so first of all, I just want to start off by um, uh, just pointing out that even as we're getting into the conversation about techno chauvinism and just its, you know, um, effects, um, we we are cognizant of, um, you know, the 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 potential that you know AI and you know data holds for the for the continent and for African women as a demographic, and so what we would like is for this potential to be able to realize in terms of you know it being actually beneficial to this to this group. Um, however, with just um, techno chauvinism is just really this uh, outlook on tech, you know, uh, this approach where we look at tech as as a fix to all our problems, and it's you know becoming. Uh, um, it, it's, it's a phenomenon that's obviously uh, global, not just on the African continent, but um, on the African continent is more prevalent, especially because, um, you know, uh, a lot of technological progress is easily just um, looked at as advancement, as its development. And so we just will go with anything that's being brought onto the continent, mm -hmm. and particularly here in terms of AI systems that are being, you know, developed and deployed across the continent. And so what we're saying is um, there is need to, you know, look at um, the harm that you know these technologies are posing and because you know um research and you know a number of studies have showed that there is a number of you know harms that are coming with a number of technologies that are being deployed particularly in a number of you know ai for development programs so we've seen with like a number of um poverty programs on the continent which have ended up being you know um where we see surveillance mass surveillance because you know they are the 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 saying oh we're, we're we're watching the progress of a number of villages and communities but what we see is active surveillance of of of, of citizens mm -hmm. and you know that's a violation of their privacy and their dignity as, as human beings and so we see you know people's humanity is basically being attacked fundamentally and you know this crosses over to a number of things where ai is being deployed in um we've seen with the the biometric um systems of identification and a number of people cannot access a number of services the ids and passport and you know of course again this goes back to our um, initial discussion around intersectionality and looking at how a number of these issues particularly um, affect african women Women who are living at the margins of society and so there is we're just saying there is a need to look at uh, we to move away from looking at tech any tech that's coming onto the continent as progress as advancement as development and rather question how does this work for the continent how does this work for the population African women and just the continent as a whole yeah um, I have to agree with um Pabina there, and um, and just add further that I think as well in um, in, under, in in framing you know tech as always progressive, um, and and how we um, think about ethical action um, is a question of how do we understand um, ethical uh, action and also like the social constraints that impact that ethical action um, from a big tech or startup uh, perspective. I think what is um, um, a way that we can come up with um, AI, uh, AI technologies um, and 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 um, um, yeah, AI te technologies that do not vi uh, vi violate fundamental human rights is in um, diversifying how we think about ethical action um, in terms of tech startups. Um, I think often, sometimes the the go to um, um, actions are in diversity hiring, mm. for instance, okay. um, or um, talking about race or, you know, more data, more data, you know, you know, data mining and, and extracting. So I think in under, always bring up those constraints, like sometimes even though we, oh yes, we want to ha have ethical, you know, AI and we want to be uh, build technology based on, you know, um, ethical principles, but how, what is our understanding of that and how do people coming into communities on the continent, in in the global within the global majority, how do they understand um, the social dynamics that impact how we conceptualize um, ethics? Um, another one, um, and, I, and I think also in how we think about consent. You know, is consent ticking on? You know, in the computer and saying, you know, I consent to these cookies, um, or or I accept these these cookies, or um, I give you my consent to use um, this technology, uh, this te uh, my data for this technology. So in di diversifying as well how we think about um, consent. Um, another one is, 
in, in my opinion, very important, and uh, Bobina like, um, alluded to this, the investment in bal uh, or the balancing of um, how we prioritize policy interests. Yes, um, we've, we've seen many people talk about um, AI for energy. We don't have energy. I, I've lived in South Africa. We've, we've gone eight hours without energy. How are we going to power a cloud you know, system? So, like, those are like true things. Are we, are we going to divert the conversation or the policy conversation uh, away from like building energy infrastructure to um, AI? So thinking very critically about how, you know, what investments we're making and um, the, uh, at what expense are we, or at what expense are we um, foregoing other policy interests for the, you know, um, 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 intention of, you know, developing um, AI technologies. And um, I think as well as uh, when we talk, you know, people when they talk about, or when we talk about AI for good or tech for good, the for good is always at the end mm. of the technology. We don't, we don't think about what happens in that process or the life cycle or that development of, of that technology. So thinking at every stage when you know, data is mined, who is harmed? What are the harms there? Um, you know, at, at design, what are the potential harms and risks? And at deployment, thinking about all the risks at that, at that stage in term, um, as opposed to what we do normally of being like, okay, this is good. Um, it is, I don't know, um, a technology for, I've, I've seen one on um, seeing or tracking how, you know, uh, seeing which kind of cli um, clients, HIV patients come back, are, potential, are most likely not to come back for their treatment, which is like, okay, we want to like see the behavior, but you know, what does that do in terms of, um, how those people come back and uh, like how we stereotype who doesn't come back for treatment mm. and how we see this pandemics. Yes, maybe it might be good. Actually, it's not very good, but you know, um, it's, it's causing more harm at other stages before that final stage. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. You've touched on um, Bobina and Kito, you've touched on very, very, um, challenging issues that continue to ail uh, the development uh, discourse and it's for everyone in the room really to find ways to better address these challenges so that um, tomorrow things can be better and um, the environments we work in can be better. Uh, I'd like to go to the next question and then if anyone online and in the room have questions or comments prepare yourself and then we'll be able to take questions. Um, so Yolanda, over to you and then Amber and Bridget, maybe with your contributions. How do you believe data protection and governance could be made more effective on the continent and Global South generally considering what is happening currently? And Yolanda, you have already alluded to the fact that you've supported um, the governments of Rwanda, Ghana and Tunisia. Maybe you can also share some of the learnings from those countries that other, other countries can emulate or can consider while they prepare their um, AI strategies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So this point is about capacity building um, for government to enforce data governance as well. And it doesn't need to be direct. It doesn't need to be regulation. It could just be providing guidance, for example, for AI developers and the technical community like on appropriate local ethical guidelines, um, data sharing in an in a ethical way, preserving privacy, et cetera, cybersecurity, data collection to make it more inclusive and representative, et cetera. So when we talk about AI policy, we don't just mean regulatory, but we could be equipping the community. So I mentioned uh, three pillars earlier um, that are key to enable the AI ecosystem in a way that supports inclusion. And those were human uh, education policy, inclusive education policy, digital infrastructure and digital inclusion, and data sharing and data governance. So these are three pillars that are common in the three national AI strategies, which we supported in Africa. But there's three or four more. And those are targeting AI adoption in key sectors in the private sector. This, the next pillar is targeting AI adoption in the public sector, including capacity building for policymakers. And then other pillars usually include ethical guidelines, um, supporting the AI community, 
or uh, scientific research. And Tony Blair Institute, as uh, Bridget mentioned, is doing a lot of great leadership on capacity building for government and policymakers. I shared in the chat a uh, report as well on um, AI for policymakers by GIZ. And, and there, with Smart Africa, there's also trainings going on for policymakers. But I think also, as Bridget mentioned, uh, we need to equip and support public sector to be able to enforce data privacy, because often countries have data privacy guidelines, but they might not have the capacity to enforce them, and cybersecurity as well, which is extremely, extremely important as we have more digital devices and they're not secured. So private sector, is it might not be uh, across countries aware or incentivized enough to uphold data privacy, cybersecurity, ethical guidelines, representation, accountability, transparency, and so many issues. So that's where um, capacity building and training for public sector is so important in, in providing, as mentioned, guidelines on data sharing or tools for trustworthy AI. So there's also the OECD AI policy observatory, um, in which I'm an expert as well, has a toolkit for trustworthy AI frameworks. So they have a database, this is OECD.AI, where people can all, all over developers, so this could be disseminated to developers, can find kind of assessment tools um, and guidelines that they can use directly, as well as following ethical principles, which, which could be adapted for local use. Um, and of course, we want these to be a adapted locally because so many, as mentioned in the, in the first question, ethical guidelines, as well as AI policies are developed in the North, but they are used and adopted in Africa. It may be directly, for example, governments we work with that would like to use as a starting point, the EU um, guide, ethic, AI ethical guidelines or OECD ones, or de facto, for example, when people use AI, use AI models pre-trained on Western data. Uh, I mean, I, another core recommendation for the public sector is a responsible AI office, but often governments don't have the resources for that. But having an in-house coordinating body that's mandated to be able to coordinate across different ministries is really important as well. And we see that in the UK, in Singapore, in Egypt as well. Thanks. Yolanda, I don't know if I can come in here on one point, Irene. Awesome. Um, so, I, Yolanda, I, I couldn't uh, say more on the regulatory and non-regulatory sort of um, examples that you've set out for how we uh, improve and, and um, continue to support data governance and policies on the continent. I think the other bit that we've seen in our work at the Institute that, that is worth mentioning is um, in regards to what diversity uh, of policymakers does for more effective governance. Um, so when I when I started this role in early 2020, we had about 28 of 54 African countries with data protection laws. Um, and 15, about 15 of those countries had data protection authorities to enforce those laws. Um, as at the start of this year, it looks like the number from, from some of our research, a number has increased uh, to about 33 countries on the continent now have data protection laws. And um, there are about 18 data protection authorities. Um, and we've seen governments have appointed a record number of uh, women to these positions. Women make about 45% of uh, these appointments to data protection commissioners. So I, I think this is a, a really cool place where we see the intersection of sort of um, uh, gender, um, feminism and governance, whereby when we have African women at the helm leading, supporting the work of uh, effective technology governance, effective AI governance, we see more activity in the space. We, we have more data protection laws. There's so many constraints, but I just wanted to take a minute to applaud the work that a lot of the ministers of ICT and data protection are doing in terms of 
providing those regulatory guidelines, um, providing those non-regulatory supports, whether it's self-assessment, um, industry guidelines, and things like that. And a lot of the women ministers that we speak to are also doing a great job of bringing um, more exposure and public education to young girls and women uh, as it relates to the field. Um, so again, I wholeheartedly support Yolanda's points around, you know, the, the, the enforcement. I mean, we can't stress that enough. There are laws, but it, we, we know that we need more funding uh, across the continent to support governments with enforcing these data protection policies. Um, but I think it's, it's a tremendous feat that we have more women pushing to get more regulatory and non-regulatory tools uh, to, to do the work that hopefully is more inclusive and more responsible than we would have otherwise. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to kind of uh, take off from what Bridget was talking about earlier in terms of the emergence of data protection law and various data protection authorities in the continent. And I think that's the, that's the key piece because you have uh, emerging regulators uh, entering into a space which before that existed very much in a state of regulatory vacuum. So the challenge for uh, these regulators is to is to move very quickly from a state of of fairly minimal or primitive data practices to to a set of robust data governance ecosystem, and I think the uh, and and again we're talking about uh, jurisdictions where often there there may be a capacity challenge, there is a resource and funding challenge as well. So one of the things perhaps that needs more attention is how. Uh, regulation and, and particularly the enforcement of regulation can be smart and there I think for countries who are kind of you know for lack of a better word arriving late to the party there is the advantage of uh, of foresight in terms of about 20 to 30 years of enforcement practices in in other parts of the world so for instance uh, th there are strategies which have worked or have not worked in other parts of the world so for instance use of the trust model in, in a country like Japan or the use of uh, very high monetary penalties by the UK to uh, convince or use that threat to convince uh, uh, companies to enter into uh, enforcement uh, contracts or for instance uh, the, the sort of gradual move from hard power uh, to soft power in a place like Spain or in the US where the FTC has largely regulated by making an example out of large players. So the key thing when you are uh, operating in a state of, of sort of uh, limited capacity and sort of small government in that sense is to then draw from these learnings and see what can be applied in, in the local context. And I think that conversation perhaps needs to happen much more. Thank you very much. Um, and everyone, Yolanda, Bridget, and Amber have been speaking on the use and importance of the Data Protection Acts or policies and the authorities in countries. And of course, since we are the IGF, we, we all know some of the countries that are yet to begin these processes or are in the process of putting this in place. Maybe it's also a clarion call for every actor in this room to find ways to engage in the discourse back in your countries, to push our governments to uh, develop this quite, you know, rapidly so that they can be used by both public and private sectors uh, to seek uh, different justice that they would need. And then going to our kind of final questions, and we have one for the audience as well, so you can start preparing um, your responses is, um, and I'll start with, let me see, who have I, who haven't I heard from the most? I think Bridget, I'll start with you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, considering the op opacity of majority of the AI systems, how can a climate of trust around artificial intelligence development and deployment in the global south be realized? I know you had already alluded to some of that, but you can speak to these um, with a vision of women, African women and girls in mind. Thank you. And then Yolanda and then my team here on the stage. Thanks, Irene. And um, again, it's wonderful to be on such a, an esteemed panel because I, I know I can't mention or won't be able to 
mention all of the tremendous um, uh, initiatives that are ongoing to do this, um, but I'll just speak to it from our perspective uh, in terms of where we see, you know, what governments in particular can do in building trust um, in AI. So at the beginning of the year, we, we actually published a report on trust in technology, specifically AI. Um, where we looked at a number of countries, including countries in Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, where, and Kenya were the four um, that, that we looked at on the continent, and asked questions around uh, how people saw um, acceptance on, on various AI use cases. Um, what we saw was that generally in the, in the global south um, emerging markets, as, as well as uh, uh, the African countries that are, I mentioned, there was a higher level of acceptance for various AI use cases than in more developed markets in, in let's say, the global north. Um, and specifically, people saw AI as an opportunity to improve welfare distribution, to improve um, health outcomes, um, and to improve agriculture, et cetera. Um, I certainly agree with Keto's point on, on definitely taking keen of, you know, not overselling the, the hype of what the technology can do. But I think what we came away from with the research was that in the global south in Africa, there's there's generally a perception that, you know, because of some of the constraints we have around resources, that technology can help us, as um, Bobina also mentioned, can help us to address some of the many challenges we have around delivering more equitably for everyone. Um, so in terms of building trust, I, I, I provide that context to say that one, in the global south, we do see that there is some level of trust. It's not tremendously high. It's not 90% as we would like, but it's, it's much higher than we have in other places. And um, we can build on top of the, the, the trust that is there by one, not overselling what the technology can do. I can't say that enough from where I sit. Um, two, we need to promote public knowledge about the technology and specifically celebrate and build on positive use cases. Um, we've seen a number of uh, positive, positive examples coming out of places uh, like Ghana, Kenya, et cetera, around uh, smart agriculture, around smart healthcare, that I think we can do more to disseminate um, its, its benefits to a larger population as opposed to, as Yolanda referred to earlier, just let's say the urban centers or just a small tech crowd in, in many African countries. And Ghana, where I sit, is typically a small group of people who consistently get this information. Um, so how can we make sure that there's more public knowledge, uh, you know, in, in diverse languages um, for women uh, that are relevant in the local context um, that we can share? I think um, the other thing is uh, we need to build, in terms of building trust, uh, the, we've all mentioned to a certain extent the fact that um, a lot of the AI technologies in Africa, especially those that are currently being deployed by governments, are actually brought on, the, are actually imported to the continent. And I think earlier this year, there was an MIT review um, review report on surveillance technologies in, in Southern Africa that was really uh, uh, sort of scary in terms of what's what's going on and when we have these technologies being brought in from outside. So I think the, the last thing I'll say here, and I know there are many more that our panelists will add, but the last thing I'll say here is that it's important that we work on international cooperation on, on trust in AI because the technologies in Africa are not just being, are not only from Africa. They're not primarily being developed by only African developers. So if we can't build a global conversation where the global South Africans have a seat at the table around what um, responsible ethical AI looks like, then we'll continue to get um, these imported technologies that that have that don't promote that trust, um, that are not effective and eventually don't promote the trust that we need to see in the technology. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I overall, we, we think there's a lot more government can do in terms of facilitating trust. Um, but we think there's a tremendous opportunity given the climate and what people want to see from their governments, what they want to see uh, delivered on the continent and um, what they think, think technology can do more generally. Thanks, Irene, back over to you. I'm just confirming if my time was to end at 10.30 or 11. I know it's 11. Pardon? 
Yes, 11. So, Yolanda, I'll bounce the question again to you to speak uh, for a few minutes, and then my panel is here with me, and I have one general question for the audience. So, let's spend the next 15 minutes reflecting on that. Thank you. I'll amplify, amplify Bridget's uh, points, um, which were brought in all very important and on point. So the Future Society's mission is to align AI through better governance. It's not just to promote AI adoption, right? It's to promote responsible, inclusive, sustainable AI adoption. And as Bridget mentioned, many countries in the global south have a lot more enthusiasm for innovation and less um, mistrust or precaution, as in Europe, for example. So there's um, there tends to be more of a culture of this. Yeah, this this will help us in education. This will help us in agriculture. This will help us in transport without having done enough tests or um, preparing precautions in terms of ethics and safety and security. For example, if we're going to use AI in the classroom, we're using AI on children, and that and AI systems fail and have problems. I mean, there are many other failures mentioned. So ethics by design, safety, privacy, security, um, testing, um, human-centered design. So there's this uh, Stanford University has a center on human, uh, human-centered design, which is all about making sure that it works for the person. Um, are critical. And another critical point, as Bridget mentioned, increasing public knowledge. When we have more public knowledge and AI literacy and digital literacy in the community, then the community can hold. AI companies, developers, uh, and regulators to account and can support AI governance by providing feedback, um, um, social media uh, in their use, um, in, in feedback to government and saying, hey, this isn't okay, this is a failure, right? Because they know, for example, this could be fixed through more testing and controls and, and representative data sets. And, and so we could also build trust. I'll just put a last plug by referring to examples, for example, um, risk management frameworks by NIST and OECD. And I pasted that in the chat, which have a collection of tools. Of course, these should be developed locally as well. And so I'll stop there and see if, if others have key points. Thank you. I start with you, Bobina. Okay. Cool. In the interest of time, I think I'll just go over my what I wanted to uh, point out very quickly. I think um, one of the things, I think there is a number of things that could just be considered in terms of creating a climate of trust in AI development and deployment on the continent. But I think one of them is just um, um, accountability. And I think that has got to be buttressed across the entire ecosystem from the developers to the governments that are you know, um, buying and deploying this uh, or even just developing the systems of the continent because uh, where harm arises, we should be able to trust it and, you know, be able to address it directly. And because we know a lot of AI models are really just uh, functioning in sort of black box, um, you know, models. And so I think accountability is one of the things that we could definitely look to, to, to a climate of trust. Um. Yeah, I think um, in the sense, I um, I would want to say that um, we, I see opacity as as an opportunity in in the sense that um, oftentimes we look at you know the harms at the end. We say, okay, these are the risks, but maybe we could ask the questions like if if we don't understand what we don't understand about a certain AI system. And if we ask ourselves questions of like legitimate aim, for instance, and proportion, uh, proportionality, um, if we don't have an answer to that, then we should build in frameworks or, you know, um, um, yeah, policy frameworks and, and, and safeguards to answer those questions. So what we don't understand about AI, we have to develop policies for them or uh, uh, governance frameworks for those um, questions. Um, and in terms and I also think that uh, we are at an advantage in, ter in terms of what Amber said about learning from other countries, but also learning from um, cross sectors. Um, earlier this year, we did a study at uh, Research ICT Africa where we looked at um, AI use in Southern Africa. And um, one of the things that we did was really trying to kind of come up with a, tax a taxonomy of, you know, how um, the kind of AI that is present in the region. And in identifying that, okay, it is, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's it's uh, um, 
functional or it is text based or it is um, analysis um, in understanding that we we came uh, we came to the realization that um, there's a silo of like different sectors. So they are within sec within different sectors in Southern Africa. People have been um, thinking about technology and how it is implied with uh, applied in those sectors. And we've seen that okay, we can take from the conservation um, um, sector. We can take from the health. And there have been you know their learnings and 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 kind of like yeah learnings that each of those sectors can bring to the table in developing national AI systems. Um, another one is just to. I think um, in understanding that we don't understand how AI systems work, we should also have this um, thinking that a lack of evidence of harm is not a lack of, um, is not the same as uh, the evidence of lack of harm. Mm -hmm. So just because we don't, you know, we, we, we don't see the harm doesn't mean it's not there. And, and that doesn't also doesn't mean that we should not come up with the safeguards um, to um, protect um, human dignity and um, human rights. And I'll stop there. Uh, I'll just sort of add to uh, what has been said so far. I think in terms of the opacity problem that we face, uh, in the last few years, there's almost been an explosion of, uh, of literature from the field of explainable AI or XAI. But I think what uh, has also happened as a result is that there isn't a lot of consensus on, on, on uh, what a lot of those concepts even mean. And what we, we run the risk of, of creating a lot of models without uh, very clear ideas on how they may be implemented. So I think what we need to do is to also center the the need for meaningful transparency, which can actually foster accountability. So we need to reframe the idea of transparency in some ways, because in most situations, it doesn't lead to the kind of accountability that it uh, seeks to achieve. And uh, particularly in the context of AI, obviously, the fact that uh, we deal with opaque algorithmic systems that complicates the landscape even further. And perhaps what we do need is not even complete transparency about the system, but enough transparency so that users who deal with them can form a conceptual model of what they, they're working with. And, and that might be enough to start uh, the process of accountability. So I think with that, I'll pause. Um, thank you very much. Are you still with us? Because we have a question for you. I know the questions may be not in the sequence that we all would hope for, but we had 90 minutes to make sure we cover um, how African women engage uh, with AI and how governments can do better. But we'd like to pose this question to you, maybe as even we walk out, because time is not on our side, and also to reflect on the role, because I know there are journalists in the room, I know there are government officials in the room. I know there are students in the room. I know there are mainstream civil society actors and human rights actors and defenders in the room. So who are the key stakeholders that should be involved in the artificial intelligence or AI ethics discourse and why? And how can they all be engaged in the conversation meaningfully? Maybe by show of hands, if you want to come in and share there's a mic in front of you, you can just switch it on. Anyone? Anyway, I'll start us off by saying, um, and this is something that I'm quite passionate about, is to talk about how journalists, both broadcast and, I mean, both legacy and alternate or alternative um, media or journalists, uh, journalists can be able to bring on this conversation closer to home. You all watch your news now either on your phone, your digital devices, or on your television sets or on your radios. And um, based on all the news that you hear, I, I can guarantee you the word AI or artificial intelligence on our African media is rarely uh, talked about. So the power that journalists and uh, community reporters have is to promote this um, topic, is to promote this debate and to start talking about these issues so that our communities at the local government level can start 
picking on this. And then um, as human rights defenders who are here in the room who don't ordinarily maybe speak or engage in technology work or artificial intelligence is for you to keenly uh, conduct human rights based um, assessments on some of the policies that are coming up on different technology models. That's on the data, data, data protection, um, the AI policy frameworks coming about being developed in conjunction with some of the uh, CV tech communities. And to look at the human rights, um, you know, when you conduct the human rights assessments, you'll be able to see where you need to ask governments uh, and other stakeholders to put emphasis on inclusion, put emphasis on uh, promoting good technology as opposed to tech for good, as Kito has said, and also really promote the hierarchy of needs because at the end of the at the end of the day, we know that there's a hierarchy of needs also as Kito and other panelists uh, tried to share before because you cannot. You cannot put <laughs> um, development of AI models when you have when you do not even have power um, powering on in your countries. So it's quite important that as different actors in this in this room who feel that you know AI is far off from our main day-to-day -day work or our strategies, it's important for you to start considering because it's here to stay, and we need models that work that work for us and are by us as Africans. And on that note, because of time, I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed today, Yolanda, Bridget, and everyone who has joined us online. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to request that you, ch you, check, um, you check our social media handles. We'll be sharing some of the resources that um, the Future Society has shared and Tony Blair Institute and some of the other resources that policy and research um, uh, Rear Africa already have. Um, we'd also like to request that um, you find uh, you find us uh, outside and engage with us, so that so that we can be able to share with you additional information that we had based on this panel. And we thank you all for coming here today, and thank you for joining us online. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and let's talk soon. Bye. Thank okay, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I forgot to ask if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I can see one already. Yeah, you can, you, yes, let me switch off. Can you hear me? Okay, my name is Eugenio Gagliardone. I'm based at Wits University in uh, uh, Johannesburg. So actually I have two questions, if we can stay a bit longer. And uh, first of all, thank you for putting this perspective together. It's refreshing, it's empowering, it's different, uh, so it's, it's great. So my first question is, uh, uh, most of, uh, some of the most visible work on uh, race and gender has focused on the US. If we think of the work of Joy Blumini and Tim Gebru, they also have roots in, in Africa, but uh, how do you engage with that kind of literature? Because uh, race and gender relationship in the United States are different from uh, Namibia, South Africa, India, and so forth. Because, you know, sometimes the US doesn't get Africa. And, uh, and how do you critically make use of this work, uh, but at the same time make sure that it's rooted where, you know, we live? And, uh, and the second question, it might be a bit strange, but I try to make it uh, um, more precise. Uh, does an uh, Afrofuturist perspective has anything to say, for example, on internet fragmentation? I'm pretty sure that that room on the other side uh, is pretty packed. It seems the, it's the obsession of this IGF. And I know that you discussed about AI, but the two things are related. Let me give you an example. Uh, um, two or three years ago, there was a lot of fuzz about the project uh, that a facial recognition company called Cloudwalk uh, signed in Zimbabwe. And uh, uh, the, 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 the problem was, oh, is it gonna be like massive surveillance of everyone, or is Cloudwalk wants to train its facial recognition software to recognize African faces? And whose data is this? Is the data of the governor of Zimbabwe, or is it belongs to Cloudwalk? And the point is, uh, maybe the Afrofuturism 
framework doesn't have a perspective of, on internet fragmentation, but it would be great if it did. Uh, because uh, one, it will bring something new, as we saw today, rather than China is this position, Singapore is this position, the US is this position. And the second point is uh, what you focused on is incredibly important, but I also see some of a risk to, to self-marginalize. We focus on the margins, we don't focus on the big uh, questions. Uh, and, but maybe there is something new that we will all benefit from if we use that specific framework. Any other question? I don't want to miss you out. Yes, uh, one, two. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> so no, I'm from India, and thank you, Amber, for being here. I think you put little perspective on, but I think the idea of uh, Africa and uh, in terms of simplicity of of simple data inclusion uh, is totally missing, right? So to begin with, I think uh, I'm a little bit of a, a pessimist in sense. Even these big AI models, whatever you call them, you know, they have to take a step back. We can come to these conversations only when we have the data inclusion. If the data inclusion is not happening, I think this conversation is basically baseless. The second point, actually, the whole number of panelists brought in were also, I think the idea of explainability will only come to sense when we have a credible number of ML and AI engineers in Africa and in the global south, whatever you call it. The XAI is still only for ML AI engineers. It does not really explain uh, to people like public policy makers or bureaucrats or anything else. So I think these two fundamental components, when they are missing, you really cannot progress in this sense of direction of, you know, how inclusion of, uh, you know, Global South in general, I would say, you know, Africa, South Asia, whatever, can come to place. Thank you. Just a comment. It's not, I don't require a response. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, wasn't she in my front, I guess? Uh, I think she was. Thank you so much for this panel. This really gives me so much empowerment and so much energy to continue advocating for Afrofeminism in a technological context. Um, it was really inspiring, and I would love to see more of such panels, for sure. Um, I was asking myself, because you talked specifically about the structural oppression of African women and techno chauvinism how do you think uh, colonial continuities play a role there in AI policy and what can be done to like also in a way decolonize these processes especially in a development context well uh, thank you uh, thank you so much for the panel it was amazing uh, I have two main questions mm -hmm. Uh, the first, um, and they're quite like more practical on the advocacy level. So I think that Bridget uh, brought very interesting points regarding like how to communicate with with governments about these issues um, and policymakers make put them sort so to say on our side. Think tech and think uh, responsible ethical ways of being technology. But I would like to know if you guys have uh, if you guys have ex specific experiences to share about this. Um, and just to give an example, I'm from Brazil, and we have conducted a work on a, some research on, in, in South America about the deployment of facial recognition systems and like tech chauvinism, tech solutionism is all around the, the, the dialogues we had with, for instance, uh, in the field of public security with police officers and so on. So like, how do you guys deal with it, especially with uh, most of the time um, professionals who are not that um, used to a human rights discourse and so on. So it would be lovely to hear if you guys have experiences. The other question relates to um, also a point that, that you guys brought about like um, how to bring information and, capac and build capacity you know, on, to help people understand how the systems work in order also to, and uh, Bridget talked about good examples and so on. But I was also interested in what are your thoughts on uh, bringing meaningful transparency using Ember's words, uh, so as also to empower them to, to question this technology, especially when they uh, have uh, negative outcomes toward the, the, the individuals themselves. And finally, very practical, if, <laughs> sorry, if Bridget could also share the, the study that she mentioned about Egypt and Kenya, uh, uh, there were all the, I uh, can't remember all of the countries. But yeah, thank you very much.
Um, oh, there's none. Okay. Our time is up, so we keep it short. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, it's such uh, it's such a great panel discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I know some of you personally and work with you. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's great to be here. I guess my question is, uh, there is like a rich uh, literature within, within Africa that uh, has outlined various theories of Afrofeminism. Uh, for example, Sylvia Tamale, uh, the amazing Ugandan scholar, Wangari Matai, they have all written about uh, Afro-feminism, African femi feminism from the perspectives and from the realities of African women. So as we are talking about Afro-feminism and governance, how do we, how can we incorporate their works into, into, into the governance and policy uh, space? Because I'm sure you all agree their work is critical. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for all the um, insightful questions. I think there's also, we're also going to think a lot about them and going to inform our work. Uh, I'm just going to answer one question which is tied to Abebas, but also the gentleman who spoke first on how um, critical feminist theories from the West and from North America um, intersect with those from the continent. And I think that question is in a way, and, and I, I say this very politely, a question that is weaponized against us as Africans, where, you know, um, your second question was about how do we, you know, view our pol uh, frameworks and policies as from in as part of the global co uh, community. And, you know, feminist discourse also, it's, it's our, the discourse, Afrofeminism doesn't exist outside of um, how race and feminism is constructed in um, America or elsewhere. I think, you know, our different perspectives, um, they all come together, they're all like, intersectional and they all in some way work together and they inform the way that we view um, and should in, in a way inform the way um, that we um, develop and design um, AI policies and um, 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 frameworks. And I think as well on on the uh, how we can action um, Afrofeminist theories, I think it's a lot of times like I think the work, most of the work in terms of like feminism is offline. You know, the kind of like patriarchal thinkings that we have and that we, you know, um, inject into the policies and into the frameworks that we, and, and government's frameworks that we um, design. The African Union uh, data policy framework, for instance, you know, we have a, a section in there on data justice. And I think when we think about justice, we also think about social, uh, uh, data justice, we think about incorporating the different um, perspectives, but also how do we break down how we how we um, conceptualize um, data governance? Like you know, is it how do we how you know how do we um, think about participation or like the different communities that I that that we want to impact or that we want to be impacted by uh, data governance frameworks? And so it's just it's 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 influencing. Essentially, I want to say it's influ it's it's about participation. It's about also our epistemic. Uh, um, understandings of um, issues, um, and yeah, I, I I I really strongly think that most of the work is not about related to technology or AI per se. It's in how we think about these issues and how when we're in a room, when people speak, who are we listening to? Who is allowed to be creative and who is not allowed to be creative? Who is harmed and who is not harmed, and so forth? It's just you know, it's all those issues that are not part of technology per se. Okay, that's all. Thank you. All right. I'll try and be very quick because we're out of time. I will start with your question. I, I'll say a lot of um, the scholars around um, Afrofeminism, Sylvia Tamale herself, are people that guide a lot of the work that we do, say with policy and just I know with a lot of our partners doing similar work. And so 
I'd say a lot of their theory, etc., is very incorporated in almost everything we do. It's a blueprint. It, there isn't so much scholarly work around Afrofeminism. And so what is there guides a lot of what we do in our academic writing, etc. And that just, uh, I'll cross over to her question as well, around um, uh, coloniality and etc. with these technologies. I definitely, we point it out in the, this particular framework, how um, we see, you know, neocolonialism with the, say, data extractivist practices ongoing on the continent, and we address those, you know, as neocolonialism and imperialism, and we call it out as such. And, um, you know, as per, you know, you say, what can be done about that? I think we just, it's a number of, it's from discussions from these and whatnot that we're able to come up with to build up a number of those. But a number of things, obviously, uh, we've suggested are, say, um, you know, um, she mentioned creative, and that's something that's very important to us because we talk about coming up with, you know, creative and new ways of thinking around. Um, say, if it's, you know, um, you know, data collection, data analysis, and just, um, overall all the practices around AI development and deployment across the continent that are that fit in with our ways of thinking and not with uh, say the hegemonic objective neutral you know uh, ways of thinking and so bring in our new ways of thinking which are afrofeminism right now and that guiding our thinking around our work yeah I'm happy to have you know this conversation with you outside the room yeah, I think I'll just uh most of what was asked was perhaps covered by these two responses. I just wanted to cover a couple of quick things. I think there was a question earlier about dealing with uh, professionals who are not quite steeped in the human rights discourse. Uh, and I think uh, Kito made a very good point earlier during the session about uh, policy objectives and, and the hierarchy of policy objectives. So a lot of times I think that sort of efficiency language perhaps speaks to stakeholders who may not be as... Uh, conversant or sympathetic to the human rights discourse. And I also feel that the efficiency uh, language actually is not used enough sometimes because often when we talk about these technological models, they are created in a very sort of Western Caucasian context and they are largely, uh, you know, without too much thought uh, e extrapolated and, and adopted. In, 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 in other context, and they don't really work in those contexts. So I think a lot of focus on also demonstrating how they don't work uh, could be quite useful in those conversations. Uh, and I think on, on Afrofeminism and race and gender, I think we covered that in, in a fair bit of detail. I, I think I just wanted to add, I think also bringing in my own context from India a little bit there. Uh, I, I think centering uh, the anti-colonialism in that conversation uh, perhaps becomes very important uh, and a lot of technological adoption that we see you know right from things like digital identity to facial recognition software is very much uh, repurposing a lot of uh, colonial technologies that we've seen being imposed for, for several uh, for, for, more, for some centuries now so I do think uh, and, and I completely agree with what Abeba said that it's very important to to ensure that 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 historical context uh, is always at the background of these conversations, and and we need to work harder to to sort of bring them in. Yeah, thank you. Bridget, I'd like to give you a minute, and yes, we've not deserted you. Do you have something maybe to share? Yes, uh, just very briefly to, to add on to Amber's comments around uh, communicating with policymakers. I, I certainly agree that one of the things we've seen in, in speaking about human rights centered AI, which we call responsible AI, but at the heart of it, it's really about centering, centering people and their needs first. Um, is that we we need to communicate uh, the social and economic benefits for policymakers. I, we can't stress that enough. And I think in the private sector, there's a lot of work being done around how um, responsible companies perform better on even stock indexes and things like that. But that's not being translated into the public sector. How do we uh, quantify and help uh, policymakers really understand um, the benefits and actually the tremendous opportunity that that human-centered AI or responsible AI affords everyone in, in being able to kind of have more effective 
technologies generally. Um, and then the second point, just briefly on decolonial AI, I think there's tremendous work being done by, um, Amber also mentioned, uh, Abiba Berhain, there's Sabelo, um, Sabelo and Bale, and uh, I may be pronouncing this last, last name incorrectly, in Lobby, I think, and at Harvard, who who talk uh, about this. And I, I think a lot of what we discuss actually plays a role in this. When we talk about decolonial AI, it's about investigating power, um, especially power that's coming from a lot of the foreign companies who own the data that then decide a lot of the ways in which we interact with AI. So I think an investigation of power and, and the distribution of resources, as well as the historical context, is really key to advancing the conversation further. But I've learned so much from the question as well, and thanks everyone for, for adding in. Thank you so much, everyone. And this is an official goodbye because we've spent over 15 minutes of our time slot. But as you can tell, it's a very much needed discourse. We'd like to invite all of you to follow us on our Twitter and go on our website and see some of the work that we've put about this topic. And we are policy with double L you should be able to find us. Thank you very much for being wonderful, a wonderful audience and we can network outside.